YouTube, today I'm going to tell you the long, tragic, sadistic story of John Joseph Jobert. Now, he conducted in a bunch of kidnapping, biting, and sadistic behavior back in the 1980s. I'm going to tell you his full story. And what found my intrigue was he said this all started for him when he was four years old. And in this video, I want to emphasize the importance on what you expose your children to. But before I get to the story, I just need a quick favor. The reason why I make my YouTube videos and I make content is so I can provide for my son, who is my everything. However, there's also a secondary reason, and that is to make my mother proud. So if you do end up liking this video, please subscribe. I'm trying to get to 100,000 subscribers. I do have other YouTube channels. All the links for them are in the description. So John, when he was interviewed by the media at the time in the mid 90s, he said that at the age of six, he fantasized about taking the life of his babysitter. When he was 11 or 12, Joe Bear's thoughts, they turned to strangling and stabbing boys, girls and young women. John, he ended up acting on his impulses when he was a bookish high schooler in Portland and he actually got away with it for years. Then on August the 23rd, 1982, Joe Burr, he abducted a young boy he didn't know on Baxter Boulevard. He then went on to strangle 11 year old Richard Stetson. He took a knife, put it in his heart, and then he bit him on the leg. Eventually, Joe Burr was scheduled to be executed via the electric chair 12 years after taking these two boys' life. And at the time when he spoke to the media, Joba actually confessed that he took the life of three boys and he injured three more in the city of Portland. He said what was key and interesting for him when he engaged in these activities was that the boys, when he looked at these boys, they reminded him of him. It's as if he's looking at himself. He doesn't like what he sees, so he wants to end it. In some weird twisted way, maybe he's committing mental suicide. He can't do it to himself because that's what he wants. So he does it to others who are similar and remind him of him. I don't know if that makes sense. I'm not a qualified psychiatrist. I'm just a charlatan. Joe Burr, who in 1996 was 32 years old, said he believes he started having the fantasies after he saw his father choke his mother when he was four. As a teenager and young man, Joe Burr said he started acting out his fantasies when he felt stress. He said, I would act up. He went on to say, and the Richard Stetson case was one such example of acting out. Initially, when he was talking to the police, he didn't say what triggered this acting out. And police considered him the first real serial killer in the city of Portland. He spent his formative years in the city developing a taste for sexual gratification through violence. But Joba never stood out to many who knew him. He was perceived as a quiet, intelligent and nerdy youth with few friends. The contrast between how Joe Bear appeared and how he actually was, wasn't the biggest surprise to serial killer experts. They are not the Charles Manson types who people get scared of when they see them on the street. This was said by Peter Smerick. He is a retired FBI criminal profile specialist who worked in the agency's behavioral science unit in Virginia. He went on to say, they are the type of people who blend in and don't draw attention to themselves. It was said that he was raised in quite the broken home. Psychiatrist experts who analyzed him during the case, they said that his mother was quite domineering and she kept him from developing relationships with other children. And I think perhaps this may have been because she was abused by her husband. So she was afraid that her son would receive similar abuse, maybe not choking, but bullying in school or something similar. She probably thought, I need to protect my child because I couldn't even protect myself. You understand the train of thought there? When the authorities eventually arrested him, he was ultimately diagnosed as having a mixed personality disorder with obsessive, compulsive and schizoid traits. And even though John strongly denied this, psychiatrist classified him as a latent homosexual. But John did tell every psychiatrist he spoke to that he actually never had sex. Now the father of Stetson couldn't understand why of all people, John targeted his son. His son was quite an athletic, lively kid. He loved basketball and he had freckles and enjoyed playing baseball with his friends. 
John did say that he regrets taking the life of Stetson and hurting his three victims who survived the Poland attacks. John went on to say, I'm sorry for the loss of their son and what I did to the family. If people can find it in their hearts to forgive me, that's all I ask for. See, John was born in Lawrence, Massachusetts on July the 2nd, 1963. He was the first child of Joseph and Beverly Joba. Two years later, Joba's sister Jane was born. She would later become a Lewiston police officer. Joba could read when he was three and started checking books out of the library when he was five. He had an IQ of 123, putting him in the superior range. Now, even though I live in America now, I'm originally from England, so I have no idea how IQ works. So if they say 123 superior, this guy was superior. While Joba's parents managed a family restaurant in the Gritty Mill City, Joba attended parochial school and served as an altar boy. Joba and Brian Lebrecht, a childhood friend, were the smallest boys in their class and got picked on by bullies. But from that bond, they formed a friendship. And Lebrecht said about John that he was quite a shy boy and he never really wanted to get revenge on the kids that were bullying him. But it was during this period that Joe Burr's disturbing fantasies began. According to three psychiatric reports on Joe Burr, prepared in 1984, when he was six, Joe Burr started fantasizing about the life or taking the life of his babysitter. He didn't seem to have anything personal against the girl that was babysitting him. He told a psychiatrist he just said that he wanted to kill. Later, Joba's thoughts turned to killing strangers he saw on the streets and people he knew. In the fantasies, Joba would stab or strangle his victims, tying and gagging those who struggled. He told a psychiatrist that when he's fantasizing about his victims, he's thinking, if you're going to do it, do it. Keep it simple and get it over with. Joba did then go on to try to explore why he got these urges. And he said that he asked his mother and his sister, did something happen when I was a child? Did something go wrong that may have triggered these urges that I have? And this is when the mother revealed that her husband, John's father, choked her and John was present and he saw all of this when he was only four years old. During this incident, his mother passed out, but John, when speaking to the psychiatrist, did claim that he actually doesn't remember any of this. He said he and the therapist believe the fantasies were an escape valve for him to forget the episode of family violence and other family arguments that he apparently saw. From that point, John said he began to have the fantasies when under any sort of stress. He went on to say, I would think these thoughts and that would relieve the tension. John said that whenever he was under stress and he would have these thoughts, they actually made him feel better. And as he got older, he it became a habit for him. Now, as I told you earlier, I'm not a psychiatrist, but to try and quantify this, maybe when he saw his mother passing out, right, her lights shut. Maybe this was the escape valve. So when he's feeling stress, he just wants to shut himself off the way his mother shut herself off, hypothetically, like obviously she was choked out. But because it was done in a violent way, I guess there was a deep seated memory in his mind that used violence and, and just blanking out as a way to cope with stress. I know that makes no sense, but you know, it's the best way I can explain it, probably. After the fantasies began, John's home life became more tumultuous. His parents divorced when he was eight, and he moved to Portland with his mother and sister when he was 11. The family settled in a two-family home in the middle-class Oakdale neighborhood. John's mother worked as a bookkeeper. The parents continued to argue about where John would live, according to a psychiatrist report prepared by Dr. David Kentsmith. John did tell a psychiatrist that he would travel several miles on his bike to go and see his father in the city of Lawrence because his mother would not give him travel money. Kent Smith, who wrote his psychiatric evaluation in this evaluation, he wrote that John's mother belittled him and she would spank him until he was 12 years old. She would continuously ridicule his father in front of him and she never approved of any friends that he wanted. John had little success with relationships in school, John told another psychiatrist that he was a small kid with a funny last name. Some of his classmates called him Jujube. John went on to say that the ages of the boys that he killed was quite significant. They were around 11 and 13 years old and this for him 
was a very unhappy time in his life. He said that targeting boys of that age was in a way like targeting himself. I was repressed. I felt like I had no control of myself and I imagine I was very angry at myself for allowing this to happen. At age 12, Jobur started delivering newspapers in his neighborhood, a job he would keep until he was 17. With the money he would earn with the newspapers and money he earned from other summer jobs, he managed to pay for his tuition at Cheveris High School, which was a Portland's all-boys Catholic secondary school. Joba was in a scouting troop, went on camping trips and briefly played trumpet in a school brass ensemble, but he spent much of his time alone, listening to his stereo in his room or building model airplanes. He never dated. John took honors courses excelling in English and in history. He maintained a 2.75 grade average and he ran indoor track but he was constantly bullied for being one of the smallest members of his class. And it was reported that John would take this personally and then became very defensive. Now his classmates had no idea the level of rage that gripped John during his four month period in his junior year. It would be years before police would identify John as the man responsible for random attacks in the same neighborhood where John delivered the telegram and the now defunct Evening Express. At 4 or 5 p.m. on December the 12th, 1979, six-year-old Sarah Canty dropped a football outside her house at Oakdale and Dartmouth Streets. As she bent down to pick her up, a young man on a green 10-speed bicycle rided towards her and then he stabbed her with a pencil. He then rode off and then Sarah, crying, ran to her house. Underneath her jacket, shirt, an undershirt was a quarter inch puncture wound. About six weeks later, on January the 24th, 1980, Vicky Goff, who was 27 years old, was walking on Daring Avenue at 7.15 p.m. She was headed to a creative writing class at the University of Southern Maine. When a young man walked by her, Goff said hi to him. Moments later, a hand came over her mouth from behind and Goff felt like she'd been punched in the side. Goff recalled that she fell down, she got up and she said, why did you do that? Then this young man ran away and then Goff realized that she'd been stabbed with a knife. She had surgery for a punctured kidney at Maine Medical Center and spent a week recovering in the hospital. Two months to the day after Goff was stabbed on March the 24th, a third grade student was walking on Daring Avenue when a young man with a 10-speed bicycle beckoned the boy to come closer. The man asked Michael Whitman, who was nine years old, where are you going? What are you doing? Then Whitman looked away for a second and he was slashed in the throat with a knife. Michael then, he ran home, he was bleeding, and it took 12 stitches to close up the two-inch wound. The crime shook the normally peaceful neighborhood. School officials told children not to walk home alone. One parent's group considered offering a reward for information leading to the arrest of the man who stabbed Michael Whitman. Goff, who recently moved to Portland when she was stabbed, left the city with her husband four months after she was attacked. I really did like Portland a lot, she said, but after that I couldn't stay. Then the attack ceased. They stopped as suddenly as they had started. John graduated from Cheveris in 1981. In the fall, he attended Norwich University, a small military college in Northfield, Vermont. John, who was studying engineering, didn't do well in this school, but he appeared to make a lot of friends for the first time. He also experimented with alcohol and marijuana, but told psychiatrists that he didn't like how they made him feel. Enjoying his newfound college freedom, John completed only 10 credits at Norwich. Then in the summer of 1982, he couldn't find work, so he enlisted in the Air Force. This was the same month that Richard Stetson's body was found near Tukey's Bridge. Richard told his parents at 7.45 p.m. on August 23rd that he was going jogging around Back Cove. Be careful, his father told him, don't go too far. Witnesses saw Stetson running around the cove's jogging path. They said he appeared to be accompanied by a young man riding a 10-speed bicycle. Then the next morning, a woman discovered Richard's bloody body in the patch of grass off Baxter Boulevard. He had been strangled and stabbed once in the chest. Slashes on Richard's right calf covered a bite mark. Now initially, a Westbrook man was indicted on charges of Stetson, but then the police, they analyzed his teeth and the bite mark on the leg and there wasn't a match. But by this time, 
John was long gone into the Air Force. He trained as a radar technician and was stationed at Uffert Air Force Base in Bellevue, Nebraska. In Nebraska, he pored over pictures in True Detective magazines, fascinated by pictures that showed terrified women. John then, he started to set his alarm for 6.30 a.m. every day. And the purpose of this was he was thinking, okay, now I can go find my next victim. Who am I gonna find? Where am I gonna go? But most mornings, he did what we all do. You press snooze, you press snooze, and then he shut off the alarm. But that's actually crazy if you stop and think about it for a second. I don't have an alarm clock because I don't need to be in an office. But for those of you that have to work, right? You put an alarm at 7 a.m., 8 a.m., etc. You probably get up 30 minutes later, wherever it may be. But you get up because you've got work to do. You get up because you've got somewhere to be, someone to see, something productive to do. He set an alarm to wake up on who he was going to kill next. But on September the 18th, 1983, John abducted Danny Joe Ebel, who was 13 years old. John tied the boy's hands and feet, put tape on his mouth, and drove him to a rural area a few miles from the Air Force base. John had stabbed Danny 11 times, and three days later, his body was found. On December the 2nd of that year, 12-year-old Christopher Walden disappeared on his way to school. The boy's body also stabbed repeatedly, was found in a grove of trees three days later. These killings horrified the local residents, but John wasn't caught until he almost struck again. On January the 11th, 1984, he accosted a church nursery school director and threatened to kill her. The woman ran away and memorized the license plate on John's car. Officers then found John at this Air Force base and then he confessed to everything. John told the police that he feared dying and every now and again he would think about the electric chair. John said at the time, I suppose I'm dealing with it in a way that anyone would deal with a death before their time, like a 32 year old terminally ill person who is hoping for a transplant. Eventually after all his confessions, John was sentenced to death and on July the 17th 1996, he was executed via the electric chair. Now just to summarize everything he did, I'm quickly gonna go through a quick timeline of all his victims. December 12th, 1979, this is where he attacked Sarah Canty. When he put a screwdriver or a pencil, the police couldn't work out what, but he put that in the side of her body. January 24th, 1980 is when he attacked Vicky Goff. March 24th, 1980 is when he attacked nine-year-old Michael Witham. August 23rd, 1982, was the Richard Stetson murder. September 18th, 1983 was the stabbing of Danny Joe Ebel. December 2nd, 1983 is when he took Christopher Walden, took his life. And then finally, January the 11th, 1984 is when he threatened the life of a church nursery school director. Now to conclude on this story, it seemed to me from all the correspondence I have read of John, he was in regret of everything he did. He was remorseful for everything he did. And he essentially said, I have a medical issue. I have a problem in here that I can't fix. And it seems like an event that took place when I was four years old became a trigger. Anytime I'm upset, anytime I'm angry, I get these urges that make me feel better. It seemed that John never used this as an excuse. He just used it to provide context on why he did what he did. This is probably why he confessed, because he thought in his head, well, I'm fucked. There's nothing else I can do. I didn't want this, but for some reason it was chosen for me. I can't control it. The best thing for me is just to die in a lawful, legal way. I'm not trying to sympathize with John. I'm just trying to put myself in his brain and try to understand his thought process from reading all the confessions and looking at all the crimes he committed. And I think it goes to show that when you have a child, I have a son, right? He's two years old. What you give to them, what you expose to them until the age of 12, I would say, everything is important because kids take things in like a sponge, right? Some parents restrict television for their kids. Some parents restrict smartphones. Smartphones these days being the hardest. And a lot of the times it's in fear of becoming addicted to an urge that the child cannot control. And in the case of John, this urge was taking the life of other people. So why don't you guys comment? Tell me what you think.